I take up my pen in the year of grace, 1783, and go back to that time 19 years ago when my father kept the Admiral Benbow in and the brown old seaman with a saber cut first took up his lodging under our roof. I was 14, but I remember him as if it were yesterday. Mother called to me from upstairs. Jim? Yes, Mother? Jim, there's a man coming up the road. Go out and see what he wants. He came plodding to the inn door, his sea chest following behind him on a hand barrow. A tall, strong, heavy, nut-brown man, his tarry pigtail falling over the shoulders of his soiled blue coat, his hands ragged and scarred with black broken nails, and the saber cut across one cheek, a dirty, livid white singing that old sea song that he sang so often afterwards. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in presenting Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the Air in the second of a unique new summer series of nine dramatic productions. The first time in its history that radio has brought to the country an entire theatrical institution. Columbia is proud to welcome Orson Welles to its roster of stars and to give him the opportunity of bringing to the air those same qualities of vitality and imagination that have made him the most talked of theatrical director in America today. Good evening. This is Orson Welles speaking. If there's anything bloodthirstier than a werewolf, it's a pirate. The Mercury Theater is playing safe. Now, if vampires and their ilk leave you as uncannily cold as old Dracula himself, who was staked down firmly and it is to be hoped permanently in his own family plot last week, then there are figures to prove that you are susceptible to buried treasure. We calculate that no decent law-abiding citizen is immune to pirates. There are cowboys and Indians, there are gangsters and G-men, but these delights are inconstant like the short skirt. I don't care how young you are. Nothing charms, nothing ingratiates, nothing wins like a one-legged, double-barreled buccaneer with earrings, a handkerchief on his head and a knife in his teeth. What could be more appropriate on the starboard rail of your four-masted brigantine? If you haven't a four-masted brigantine, you have Treasure Island. It's in your library because it's a great English classic, and this evening, because it's a great story... It's on your radio. That's what I mean by playing safe. Once there was a small boy who asked his stepfather, who had written a number of books, please, to write something interesting. The stepfather, seeing his point, immediately contributed a serial to something repugnant called Young Folks, a periodical circulated among that section of the English nation known as Tiny Tots, who were very prevalent in the 80s. The name of the serial was The Sea Cook by Captain George North, and if the tiny tots didn't think it was interesting, they should have been boiled in oil. The story was begun, the stepfather says, on a chill September morning by the cheek of a brisk fire and the rain drumming on the window. The small boy himself helped a lot, even though Captain North got the credit, and so did a third and equally incurable small boy, the author's father. They drew a map first, the chart of an island showing very queer and wonderful attractions, Spyglass Shoulder, for instance, and Skeleton Island, and the North Cache with a bar silver. And then, on that chill September morning by that brisk fire of theirs, the three plotters buried their plunder, doubloons and louis d'or, gold and silver and rich jewels and pieces of eight. That's why the story was finally called Treasure Island. It's foolish to guess who's tuned in on this broadcast, but if in some way... Well, we were retelling the story, hoped devoutly that he, who the Samoans laid to rest in the hills of their own faraway treasure island and who is still known out there only as the great teller of tales, would not wish tonight as he did so unaccountably at first to suppress the real name of Captain George North. The small boy, of course, should have been decorated. It's a better world because he asked for something interesting then he was lucky. There are millions and millions of small boys. But only one of us had Robert Louis Stevenson for a stepfather.
Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson with Orson Welles as Long John Silver and as Jim Hawkins who tells the story. Treasure Island. Squire Trelawney, Dr. Livesey, and the rest of the gentlemen having asked me to write down the whole particulars about Treasure Island from the beginning to the end, keeping nothing back but the bearings of the island and that only because there is treasure not yet lifted, take up my pen in the year of grace 1783 and go back to that time 19 years ago when my father kept the Admiral Benbow in and the brown old seaman with a saber cut first took up his lodging under our roof. I was 14... But I remember him as if it were yesterday. Fifteen men on a dead man's kill. Mother called to me from upstairs. Jim? Yes, Mother? Jim, there's a man coming up the road. Go out and see what he wants. He came plodding to the inn door, his sea chest following behind him on a hand barrow. A tall, strong, heavy, nut-brown man, his tarry pigtail falling over the shoulders of his soiled blue coat, his hands ragged and scarred with black broken nails, and the saber cut across one cheek, a dirty, livid white, singing that old sea song that he sang so often afterwards. Oh, open up in there! Now then, boy. Yes, sir. What do you call this place? The Admiral Benbow Inn, sir. Admiral Benbow, eh? Nice, lonely-looking, pleasant-situated grog shop. Folks don't come here much, do they, boy? Not much company? No, sir, most pity. No? Well, then it's the birth for me. I'm a plain man, rum and bacon, eggs, all I want, and that head up there for to watch ships off. Never mind, to stay here a bit. Here, you matey. You were the wheelbarrow. Bring up alongside, help up my chest. You two boys, heavy. Yes, sir. Call me Captain, boy. Captain. Yes, Captain. Just one thing more. Yes, Captain. You ain't seen him, have you? No, sir. Who do you mean? Along the road, maybe. You might have seen him somewhere, as you can't tell. Let me know if you do, boy. A seafaring man. Yes, sir. With one leg. Yes, sir. Captain! Yes, Captain. Bring me a noggin of rum, boy. And so he came to live under our roof. We never knew his name. We called him the Captain. He was a very silent man by custom all day. He hung around the cove or upon the cliffs with a brass telescope staring out to sea. All evening he sat in a corner of the parlor next to the fire and drank rum and water very strong. And every day when he came back from his stroll, he would ask the same question. Jim? Yes, Captain? Any seafaring men go by today along the road? No, Captain. And Jim? Yes, sir? You're a good boy, Jim. You wouldn't lie to me ever, would you, Jim? No, sir. You haven't seen him, have you, Jim? Jim, there's a silver popney for you on the first of every month. If you'll keep your weather eye open for a seafaring man with one leg. Let me know the moment you see him, won't you, Jim? A seafaring man with one leg. How that personage haunted my dreams. On stormy nights when the wind shook the four corners of the house and the surf roared along the cove and up the cliffs, I could see him in a thousand forms. Now the leg would be cut off at the knee, now at the hip. Now he was a monstrous kind of a creature who had never had but one leg, and that in the middle of his body. You'll keep your weather eye open, won't you, Jim? For a seafaring man with one leg. A seafaring man with one leg. Months went by. The captain bade fair to ruin us. We kept on staying week after week, month after month. And never a penny of money, Jim. Not a penny as he paid us since the day he came here. And me, a poor widow woman. Mother, why don't you ask him for some? Well, I'll tell you the truth, Jim. I'm afraid to ask him. 
I'm afraid of the man. Now if your father was... Alive. In all that time, none of us ever saw him open the great sea chest that was in his room. There were nights when he took a deal more rum and water than his head could carry. Often I heard the house shaking and all the neighbors joining in for dear life. Drink and the devil had Quiet, amidships! Quiet! And he would force them all to listen to his stories. Dreadful stories they were about hanging and walking the plank and storms at sea and the dry tortigas and wild deeds and places on the Spanish main. By his own account, he must have lived his life among some of the wickedest men that God ever allowed upon the sea. The captain had been living with us almost a year when there occurred the first of the mysterious events that rid us at last of his presence. It was one January morning, very early, a pinching, frosty morning. The captain had risen earlier than usual and set down the beach with his telescope under his arm. My mother was upstairs and I was lying the breakfast table against the captain's return when the parlor door opened and a stranger stepped in. Sonny, come here, Sonny. Is this table for my mate, Bill? I don't know you, mate, Bill. I'm laying this for a man who stays in the house. We call him the captain. Well, my mate Bill would be called the captain, like as not. Now, nah, we'll put it for argument, like, that your captain's got a cut on one cheek. And we'll put it, if you like, that that cheek's the right one, eh? Well, God save me, there he is now. There's my mate Bill. That's him with a spyglass under his arm. Bless his old heart, to be sure. You and me'll just get back behind the door, Sonny. And we'll give Bill a little surprise, we will. Bless his heart, I says again. Or a dead man kiss. Yo! Hello, Bill. Come, Bill. You knows me. You knows an old shipmate, Bill Shirley. Black dog. Black dog as ever was. <laughs> Bill, Bill. We seen a sight of times, as to. So you run me down. Here I am, we'll speak up, what is it? That's you, Bill. You're in the right of it, Billy. I'll have a glass of rum from this dear child here, what I've took such a liking to. And we'll sit down, if you please, and talk square like old shipmates. Sit down, Bill. And you, Sonny, get out. Yes, sir. And none of your keels on me, do you hear? For a while, I could hear nothing but a low gabbing. Suddenly, the voices began to grow higher. No, no, no! And an end on it! If it comes to swinging, swing all, say aye! 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 I saw Black Dog streaming blood run off down the road. Presently, the captain returned, alone. Jim, Jim, give me, give me some rum. Captain, are you hurt? I, I must get away from here. Get away, that's what. I must get away from here. What's happened, Jim? What's happened? It's the captain, Mother. The captain? Dear, dearie me, what a disgrace. I've been afraid of something like this ever since he came into the house with that old chest of his. I got the rum and tried to put it down his throat, but his teeth were tightly shut and his jaws were as strong as iron. An hour later, our friend Dr. Livesey came. Doctor, what shall we do? Where is he wounded, Doctor? Wounded? A fiddlestick's end. No more wounded than you or I. The men's had a stroke. Uh, uh, where's, where's Black Dog? Black Dog? There is no Black Dog except what you have in your own back. You've been drinking rum, man, and you've had a stroke. No, listen to me. One glass of rum a day won't kill you. But if you take one, you'll take another and another. And then you'll die. Die and go to your own place like the man in the Bible. And the world will be rid of a very dirty scoundrel. Do you understand that? The name of rum for you is death. <laughs> About noon the next day, I stopped at the captain's door with some medicine. Who is it? It's me, Jim. Come in, Jim. Come in. 
He was lying very much as we'd left him. Jim, you're, you're the only one here that's worth anything. You know I always been good to you. Never a month but I've given you a silver fopenny for yourself. Now you see, mate, I, I'm pretty low and deserted by all. Jim, you'll bring me a, a noggin of rum, won't you, matey? But the doctor... Doctors is all swabs! Well, don't have a drain of rum, Jim. I'll have the horrors. I've seen some of them already. I've seen old Flint in the corner there behind you, as plain as Prince. I've seen them. Jim, I'll give you a golden guinea for a noggin. When I brought it to him, he seized it greedily and drank it out. Uh, uh, that's some better, sure enough. Now, matey, did that doctor say how long I was to lie here in this old berth? Why, a week at least. Uh, thunder a week! I can't do that. They'll have the black spot on me by then. The lovers is going about getting the wind of me this blessed moment. The lovers just couldn't keep what they got and want to nail what's another's. It's it's in my old sea chest, Jim. The thing they're after. They'll tip me the black spot, I know it. I was first mate, I was. Old Flint's first mate. And I'm the only one as knows the place he buried it. He gave it me at Savannah. When he lay a dying. What's the black spot, Captain? A summons from old Flint's crew. A summons. And them as gets it, Jim, is lucky when they're dead. So, a week went by. And then, about three o'clock of a bitter foggy, frosty afternoon, I saw someone drawing slowly near along the road. He was plainly blind, for he tapped before him with a stick, and he wore a great green shade over his eyes and nose, and he was hunched as if with age or weakness, and wore a huge old tattered sea cloak with a hood. Thank Christian friends, take pity on a poor blind mariner as has lost the precious sight of his eyes in the gracious defense of his native country, England, and God bless King George, where or in what part of this country he may now be. You were at the Admiral Benbow Inn, sailor. Eh? Black Hill Cove. I hear a voice, a young voice. It's here where I miss me delights. Will you give me your hand, my kind young friend, and lead me into the captain? I held out my hand, and the horrible, soft-spoken, eyeless creature gripped it in a moment like a vice. Now, boy, take me into the captain. Sir, upon my word, I dare not. You been... heard me. Take me in straight. Oh. Will you take me into the captain? Yes, sir. Good. And when I'm in view... Say to him, here's a friend for you, Bill Bones. If you don't, I'll twist your arm right out of your body. Do you hear? Yes, sir. Steph, you patter, damn you. Now, forward march. Here's a friend for you, Bill Bones. Now, Bill, sit where you are. Business is business. Hold out your left hand, Bill. Boy, take his left hand by the wrist and bring it near to my right. Here's a little bit of paper for you, Bill Bones. <laughs> Now that's done, I'll be going. Goodbye, Bill. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. 
Jim? Yes, Captain. What time is it, Jim? Ten o'clock. Ten o'clock. Ten o'clock, six hours. We'll deader them yet, you and Black Dog and Long John Silver. The whole crew of them will. Captain. 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 The captain was dead. And there we were. My mother and I, a woman and a boy of 14, alone at night in the house with the dead captain's body on a parlor floor. You know this money he does. A whole year, never a penny from him. And me, a poor widow. But, Mother, if Black Dog comes back, or the blind man... Black Dog, fiddlesticks. There's something in that old chest of his upstairs that's rightfully mine. And we'll have that chest open if we die for it. Mother. Close the blinds, Jim. We don't want anybody watching us from the outside. We have to get the key off. <gasps> Look, Mother. Look. On the floor, close to the dead man's hand, there was a little round of paper blackened on one side. The black spot. I took it up and found... You have till ten tonight. Four hours. Now, Jim, find that... I felt in his pockets one after another. It's round his neck. Get open his shirt. There, sure enough, hanging on a bit of tarry string, we found the key. Then my mother got a candle in the bar, and holding each other's hands, we went upstairs to his room. Give me the key, Jim. Now then. <laughs> Oh, nothing in here. Not a thing of value, not a penny. Mother, look. There, before us, lay the last things in the chest, a bundle tied up in oilcloth looking like papers, and a canvas bag that gave forth at a touch the jingle of gold. You see, Jim, I knew we'd find it. But I'll show these rogues that I'm an honest woman. I'll have me do and not a farthing over. Here, here, Jim, hold this bag. The coins were of all countries and sizes. Doubloons and Louis d'Or and guineas and pieces of eight. Mother! What is it, Jim? Mother, listen. Come, Mother. Mother, take the hole and let's be gone. No, I'll have me do, Jim, and no more. But, Mother, you heard him. That was the blind man. I know what I'm doing. I know the right. But, Mother, you don't know. Shh. Hold it. I'll take what I have. And I'll take this. These papers. Quick, Mother, quick. Take my hand. Next moment, we had opened the door and were in full retreat toward the village. Look, Jim. Over the hill. There they come. Run, Mother, run. Jim. Jim, I'm going to faint. Oh, Jim. Take the money and go on. Mother. Oh. Mother. She had fainted. I managed somehow to drag her down the bank into the shadow of the ditch. A moment later, the house was surrounded. Burns! Burns! Bill Burns! Will you answer me? Down with the door, then! In, you lovers! Loot the house and find it! Bill's dead! Hurt you! Bill's dead! Search him, you shirking lovers! And the rest of you locked and get the kiss! It was a good thing my mother had fainted or she would have had to watch with me while our poor house was pulled apart and smashed. Whatever it was they were after, they did not find it. Well, is it there? The money's there! Jim, what is it, Jim? What are they after? The map, Mother. Flint's map. Thank you. That's the signal. Tell him that. Hold on, you sneaks. It's in the house. You know it is. Shiver my soul if I had my eyes. The signal, too. The signal. You dogs. You had your hand on hundreds. 
on thousands, or you give it up now. You'd be as rich as kings if you can find it, and you know it's there, and you stand there skulking. There wasn't one of you dead by his bill, and I did it, a blind man, and I'm to lose my chance for you. I'm to be a poor crawling beggar spongy for rum, when I might be rolling in a coach. If you had the pluck of a weevil in a sea biscuit among the lot of you. That's the last signal. Get out! Get him in Dog! Black dog! Johnny! Dirk! You won't leave old Bill, mate! Not old Bill! Johnny! Black dog! Don't leave old Bill! Not old Bill! Not old dog! Kill me! Help me, mate! Help me! When they picked him up where he lay on the road on his side, Pew was stone dead. The horsemen, as it turned out, were revenue officers who had some news of a strange lugger in Kit's Hole, and it set forth that night in our direction. They took my mother to a neighbor's house. Well, Hawkins, they got the money, you say. Well, what in fortune were they after? More money, I suppose. No, Sergeant, not money, I think. In fact, sir, I believe I have the thing in my breast pocket. And to tell you the truth, I should like to put it in safety. To be sure, boy, quite right. Uh, I'll take it. I thought perhaps Dr. Livesey... Uh, what, uh, yes, Dr. Livesey. Perfectly right, perfectly right. A gentleman and a magistrate. Dogger! Yes, sir. You have a good horse. Take this line up behind you. Yes, sir. We rode hard all the way till we came to Dr. Livesey's door. Doctor, the doctor's stopping tonight at the squire's. Squire, so there we go, boys. We had arrived at the squire's. He rose to meet us very stately and condescending. Come in, gentlemen. Good evening, squire. Good evening, Good evening Doctor Livesey. Good evening to you, Benjamin. Uh, what good wind brings you here? Then the officer stood up straight and stiff and told his story. Sergeant, you are a very noble fellow. This lad Hawkins is a trump, I perceive. Hawkins, ring that bell. Sergeant must have the mail. And so, Jim, you have the thing that they were after, have you? Here it is, sir. Hmm. Uh, you've heard of this Captain Flint, I suppose, Squire. Heard of him? Heard of him, you say? He was the bloodthirstiest buccaneer that sailed. Blackbeard was a child, a friend. The Spaniards were so prodigiously afraid of him that I tell you, sir... I was sometimes proud he was an Englishman. What in Sir Fleas had he money? Money! One of those villains after but money! That we shall soon know. What I want to know is this. Suppose I have here in my pocket some clue to where Flint buried his treasure. Will that treasure amount to much? Amount, sir? It will amount to this. If we have the clue you talk about, I fit out a ship in Bristol Dock and take you and Hawkins here along, and I'll have that treasure if I search a year, sir. Very well. Now, if Jim is agreeable, we'll open the packet. Oh, a map of an island with latitude and longitude and writing. Tall tree, spyglass shoulder, bearing a point to the north of northeast. Skeleton island, southeast by east, ten feet. The bar of silver is in the north cap. And then you'll give up this wicked practice at once. Tomorrow, I start for Bristol. In three weeks' time, three weeks, two weeks, ten days, we'll have the best ship, sir, and the choicest crew in England. Hawkins shall come as cabin boy, you live the ship's doctor, I am Admiral. I'll go with you, Squire, so will Jim, and be a credit to the undertaking. There is only one man I'm afraid of. Who's that? Name the log, sir. You, sir, for you cannot hold your tongue. In a few moments, we shall be bound for Treasure Island with Dr. Livesey, Squire Trelawney, and Jim Hawkins. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. WABC, New York. Tonight, the Columbia Network is bringing you Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. As Jim Hawkins was telling us, we are eager to leave the Venbow Inn behind and set out for the docks in Bristol. With 
longer than the squire imagined ere we were ready for the sea. Weeks passed on then. One fine day there came a letter from the squire, from Bristol. Dear Livesey, the ship is forth and pitted. It lies at anchor ready for sea. It was the crew that delayed me, till the most remarkable stroke of fortune brought me the very man that I required. I was standing on the dock, when by the merest accident I fell in talk with him. He had hobbled down there that morning with a parrot on his shoulder to get a smell of salt, he said. Out of pure pity, I engaged him on the spot to be ship's cook. Long John Silver, he is called, and has lost an egg. Well, sir, I thought I'd only found a cook, but it was a crew I'd discovered. Between Silver and myself, we got together in a few days a company of the toughest old sorts imaginable. I declare we can fight the frigate. See you at home. And the treasure, it's the glory of the sea that has turned my head. On the 16th of April, the schooner Hispaniola set sail from Bristol Harbour. It was more than 19 years ago, but I can remember it as if it were yesterday. Me and my new blue cabin boys. Clerk, 19 years ago. Leaning over the rail, waving goodbye to my mother, and doing my best not to cry. For at the last moment, it sort of hurt to leave her. And it was the first time I had been away from home. Then, a little before noon, Captain Smollett gave an order. The bosun sounded his pipe, and the crew began to man the capstan bar. Soon, the anchor was short up. Soon, it was hanging dripping at the bars. Soon, the sail began to draw, and the land and shipping to flit by on either side. The Hispaniola had begun her voyage to the Isle of Treasure. On the second day out, I made the acquaintance of our one-legged ship cook, Long John Silver. Hey there, boy. Come in. Come on in to Long John's galley. To tell you the truth, at the very first mention of Long John Silver in the squire's letter, I had taken a fear in my mind that this might be the very one-legged sailor that I had watched for all those months at the Benbow Inn. But one look at him was enough. I had seen Captain Bones and Black Dog and Blind Pew, and I knew what a buccaneer looked like. Very different from this clean and pleasant-looking sea cook. His left leg was cut off close to the hip, and under the left shoulder he carried a crutch, which he managed wonderfully, hopping about on it like a bird. Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Are you Mr. Silver, sir? Yes, me lad, such is me name to be sure. And you're Hawkins, eh? Nobody more welcome than yourself, me lad, in old John's galley. <laughs> Sit down, hear the news. Your first trip to see Hawkins? Yes, sir. Well, well. Well, there's a lot of things you're going to learn before this here voyage is over. What do you think, Hawkins? And if there's anything you want to know, Hawkins, you just come to old John Silver and ask him, see? He'll tell you. His galley was as clean as a new pin. The dishes hanging up burnished and his parrot in a cage in one corner. Here's Captain Flint. I call my parrot Captain Flint. Yeah, the parrot, that's the famous buccaneer. Here's Captain Flint, predicting success to our voyage. Wasn't you, Captain? <laughs> Yeah, she's a powerful old bird, is Captain Flint. Two hundred years old, if she's a day, and if anybody's seen more wickedness, it must be the devil himself. She sailed with England, the great Captain England, the pirate, on the old walrus, that's Flint's old ship. And I've seen her muck with the red blood and fit to sink with gold. She's been at Madagascar and at Malibar and Suriname and Providence and Portobello. To look at her, you'd think she was a baby, Hawkins, but... You smell powder, haven't you, Captain? Uh, stand by to go by. And blood, eh, Captain? Put it in the ship. Uh, Animal hands. Uh, and pieces of eight, eh, Captain? Pieces of eight. 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 At the end of the third week, we left Madeira behind us. The ship proved to be a good ship. The crew seemed to be capable seamen. There was only one man aboard who was not satisfied. And that was the ship's master, Captain Smollett. I'll speak plain. I don't like it. I don't like this cruise. I don't like the men. I don't like me officers. That's short and sweet. But nobody paid much attention to him. Every man on board seemed well content. Double grog was served on the least excuse. There was duff on odd days, and always a barrel of apples standing broached in the waist for anyone to help himself that had a fancy. Never knew good come of it yet. Spoil folks' lands, make devils. That's my belief. We're not home again yet. But good did come of that apple barrel. It was about the last day of our outward voyage. Sometime that night, 
or at latest before noon of the morrow, we should sight the treasure island. Just after sundown, when all my work was over, I thought I should like an apple. I ran on deck. The watch was all, wo all forward looking out for the island. I got into the apple barrel. Suddenly, I heard voices on deck. Look here, barbecue. How long are we going to stand off and on like a blessed bumboat? Why, son, did I want to go into that cabin? I do. I want their pickles and wine in there. How long? By the powers, the last moment I can manage, and that's how long. How many tall ships think you have I seen laid aboard? And how many brisk lads drying in the sun at execution dock? And all for this same hurry, and hurry, and hurry. Ain't a first-rate seaman, Captain Smollett. Say of the blessed ship for us. You're all seamen aboard here, are you? All folks of lands, you mean. I know the sort you are. You're never happy till you're drunk. It's your long job. I don't know what this treasure is, do I? No more to use as you. And here's this squire and doctor with a map and such. Well, then I mean this squire and doctor shall find the treasure for us and help us to get it aboard by the powers. After that... After that... What do we do with them, John Silver, after that? Well, what would you think we does with them? Put them ashore like maroons? Or cut them down like that much pork? Duty is duty, mates. Wait. Wait is what I says. When the time comes, why, let her rip. Land ho! What's that? What's that? Land ho! to the southwest of us, we saw it. Treasure Island. Ten minutes later, we were gathered in the cabin. The squire, Dr. Livesey, the captain, and myself. Now, Hawkins, you have something to say. Speak up. I did as I was bid. I told them the whole story of Silver's conversation. When that was done, all three, one after another, and each with a bow, drank my good health. Then the squire rose. Captain Smollett, you were right and I was wrong. I own myself an ass. I await your orders, sir. Silver is a remarkable man. Here's the way I see it. We must go on because we can't turn back. And what I propose is that we don't wait for them to surprise us, but that we come to blows at our own time and when they least expect it. There must be some faithful lands left. Well, we must find out who they are. Jim Shear can help us more than anyone. The men are not shy with him, and Jim is a noticing lad. Hawkins, I put prodigious faith in you. In the meantime, talk as we please. There were only seven out of 26 on whom we knew we could rely. And of these seven, I was a boy. So that the grown men on our side were six to their 19. Next morning, there was not a breath of air moving, nor a sound, but that of the surf booming half a mile away along the beaches. A peculiar stagnant smell hung over the anchorage. The heat was sweltering, and the men grumbled fiercely over their work. Mutiny, it was plain, hung over us like a thundercloud. Around noon, Captain Smollett came up on deck. Hey, lads! We're not damn, we don't find not a thought. Quick turn ashore and let nobody. So you can take the gate. And if any is pleased, may go ashore for the afternoon. Hey! Hey! Hey, hey wait a bit, wait a bit, Ben. What's the hurry? What's the hurry? John hey. Silver suspected a trick. He hopped around the deck on his one wait leg. A bit, man. What's the hurry? Wait a bit, will you, man? Soon the party was organized. Six fellows were to stay on board, and thirteen, including Silver, began to embark. Suddenly, I had a mad notion to go ashore, too. In a jiffy, I had flipped over the side and curled up in the foresheets of the nearest boat. No one took notice of me. The crew was raced for the beach. No sooner had we touched shore when I leaped out and plunged into the nearest thicket. Behind me, I could hear John Silver's voice. Hey, Jim! Jim, my boy! Hey, Jim! 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 John Silver was quick at his work. Two faithful members of the crew were murdered on the island that afternoon. Only an hour after we landed...
second killing I saw with my own eyes. From where I lay hidden among the trees. Will you tell me you let yourself be led away with that kind of a mess of swamps? As sure as God sees me, I'd sooner uh, lose me hand than turn to give me due. Mate, it's because I think gold dust of you. Gold dust. John Silver, you're mate of mine no more. But if I die like a dog, I'll die in me duty. You've killed Alan, have you? Kill me too if you can. But I defy you. He started to walk away. Try this then. Long John whipped the crutch out of his armpit and sent it hurtling through the air. <laughs> It struck him in the back and killed him. Then, Silver brought out a whistle. I didn't wait. I ran. I ran as I never ran before. Daddy McGraw! <laughs> I looked up the side of a hill. Far above me, I saw something leap behind the trunk of a tree. It seemed dark and shaggy. I turned and began to run. Suddenly, a thing appeared in front of me, and running forward, threw itself on its knees before me, and held out its clasped hands in supplication. Oh! Who are you? I'm poor Ben Don, I am. I haven't spoke with Christian these three years. Three years? Were you shipwrecked? No, no, mate, maroon. Three years, lived on goats since then, and berries and oysters. Mate, my heart is sore for Christian died. You mightn't happen to have a piece of cheese about you now. No? Well, many a night I've dreamed of cheese, toasted mostly, and woke up again and here I was. What'd you call yourself, mate? Jim. Jim? Jim, Jim. Well, now, Jim, you wouldn't think. You wouldn't think I was rich to look at me, would you now? Why, no, not in particular. Oh, well, but I am, Jim. I'm rich, rich, powerful rich. Oh, Jim, you'll bless your stars, you will. You were the first that found me. Suddenly his eye fell on the Hispaniola lying far below us. Between it and the land was the jelly boat with five men moving towards shore. But I could not tell if they were our men or the mutineers. Jim, tell me true. That ain't Flint's ship. It's not Flint's ship and Flint is dead. There are some of Flint's hands aboard, worse luck for the rest of us. Not a man with one leg. Silver. Woo! If you were sent by Long John... Oh! I'm as good as pork, I know it. I was in Flint's ship with John Silver when old Flint buried the treasure. He and six along, six strong seamen. They was ashore nigh on a week. And then one day, here come Flint by himself in a little boat, and the six all dead. Dead and buried along with the treasure. How he done it, not a man of us could make out. I told him the purpose of our voyage and the predicament in which we now found ourselves. Oh, that Long John, he's a bad un. And you're all in a clove hitch, ain't you? Well, you just put your trust in Ben Gunn. Ben Gunn's the man to help you. You tell that to your squire, Jim. Ben Gunn's the man, that's what you say. And Ben Gunn says you has ideas of his own. Ah! Look at that. Far below us, we saw a Union Jack fluttering in the air above the woods. There's your friend, sure enough. More likely it's the mutineer. No, mate, silvered fly the Jolly Roger. That's your friend, sure enough, ashore in the old stockade made years and years ago by Flint. Oh! What's that? That's the ship cannon. They're shooting at the stockade. Come on. Wait a minute, Jim. Wait. Ben Gunn is fly. Rum wouldn't bring me down there. But remember, Jim, Ben Gunn's the man to help you. And when Ben Gunn is watered, you know where to find him. Just where you found him today. I started to run towards the flag. Hey, Jim! Jim! Yes, sir? <laughs> you won't forget that piece of cheese, will you, me? It was less than a mile to the stockade. It was heavy running through the wood. The shooting was getting louder. Suddenly before me, I saw a clear smoke of muskets fired nearby. Hey there! Who goes there? Hey, don't shoot, it's me! Who's me? Me, Jim Hawkins! It's me! A moment later, I was over the stockade among my friends. And soon afterwards, the firing ceased. The mutineers were saving their powder. The stockade was a good place with a paling six feet high all around it. We could have held it against the regiment. And here, Captain Smollett decided to stay and await our enemy's next move. I told Dr. Livesey and the squire about Ben Gunn. Hey! Flag of truce! 
Break it through! Who's that? It's Silver. Keep indoors, man. Ten to one, this is a trick. Who goes? Stand or we fire! Flag and truth! Doctors, watch on the lookout. Dr. Livesey, take the north side if you please. Yes. Jim, the east. Gray, west. The watch below, all hands to load muskets. Lively men and careful. What do you want with your flag of truth? Captain Silver, sir! Come to my term! Captain Silver? Are you black-hearted scoundrel? Silence, sir! Silence. If you wish to talk to me, you can come. And that's all. If there's any treachery, it'll be on your side. And the Lord help you. That's enough, Captain. A word from you's enough. I know a gentleman, and you may lay to that. You'd better sit down. Uh, you ain't a gonna let me inside, Captain? It's a main cold morning, to be sure, sir, to sit outside upon the sand. Oh, there's Jim. Top of the morning to you, Jim. Well, there you're all together like a happy family in a manner of speaking. If you've anything to say, my man, better say it. Right you were, Captain Smollett. Duty is duty, to be sure. Well, here it is. We want that treasure. We'll have it. That's our point. You just do save your lives, I reckon, and that's yours. You have a chart, haven't you? That's as may be. Oh, well, you have. I know that. What I mean is, we want your chart. You give us the chart to get the treasure by, and I'll give you my affidavit upon my word of honor to clap you somewhere safe for sure. Is that all you have to say? Every last word by thunder. Refuse that and you've seen the last of me but musket balls. Very good. Now you lay on me. If you'll come up one by one, unarmed, I'll engage to clap you all in irons and take you home to a fair trial in England. If you won't, as my name's Alexander Smollett, I've flown Miss Sovereign's colours and I'll see you all to Davy Jones. You can't find the treasure. You can't sail the ship. And you can't fight us. I stand here and tell you so. And that the last good word you'll get from me. Now, tramp me like. <laughs> laugh. <laughs> laugh, my thunder, laugh. For an hour, Doc, you'll laugh on the other side. And then the die will be the lucky ones. <laughs> Ten minutes later, nothing remained of the attacking party but the five who had fallen. Four on the inside and one on the outside of the palisade. The mutineers did not come back that night. They had got their rations, as the captain put it. The next day was stifling hot. After dinner, Dr. Livesey sent for me. Uh, Jim, was it cheese you said Ben Gunn had a fancy for? Yes, sir, cheese. Well, Jim, uh, just see the good that comes of being dainty in your food. You've seen my snuff box, haven't you? And you never saw me take snuff. The reason being that in my snuff box I carry a piece of parmesan cheese. A cheese made in Italy. Very nutritious. Well, that's for Ben Gunn. Well, goodbye, my lad. Then he took up his hat and pistols, girt on his cutlass, put the chart in his pocket, and set off briskly through the trees. That afternoon, the blockhouse being stifling hot, and the little patch of sand inside the palisade ablaze with midday sun. And so much blood about me, and so many poor dead bodies lying around. A new idea came into my head. This was to swim out under cover of the night, cut the Hispaniola adrift, and let her go ashore where she fancied. The mutineers, after their repulse of the morning, had nothing nearer their hearts than to up anchor and away to sea. This, I thought, would be a fine thing to prevent. It was evening when I reached the east coast of the island. I could see the Hispaniola lying at anchor offshore. And there was the Jolly Roger, the black flag of piracy, flying from her peak. As the last rays of daylight dwindled and disappeared, absolute darkness settled down on Treasure Island. The next night I was back on land. I was proud of myself, and with good reason. I had grounded the Hispaniola, beached her up tidily in the North Inlet with no harm done safe from the mutineers. I had no trouble finding the stockade. Coming in from the shore, keeping close in shadow where the darkness was thickest, I crept into the blockhouse. I could see nothing. The doctor and the squire must have worried about me. I should lie down in my own place, I thought, and enjoy their faces when they found me in the morning. I felt for a place to lie down. Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! 
Don't go. Don't go. Bring a torch, Dick. Where? Well, shiver my timbers. Jim Hawkins. Dropped in like, eh? Quite a pleasant surprise for poor old John. I've always liked you, I have, Jim, for a lad of spirit. I picked her my own self when I was young and handsome. I always wanted you to join my camp and take your share and die a gentleman. And now, my cock, you've got to. You can't go back to your own lot. Where are they? Where do you think, my son? Have you killed them? What do you think? Well, I'm not such a fool, but I know pretty well what I have to look for. But there's a thing or two I have to tell you. And the first is this. Here you are in a bad way. Ship lost, treasure lost, men lost. And if you want to know who did it, it was I. Oh, I was in the apple barrel the night we sighted land. And I heard you, John, and you, Dick Johnson, and Hans, who is now at the bottom of the sea, and told every word you said before the hour was out. And as for the schooner, it was I who cut her cable. And it was I who brought her where you'll never see her more, not one of you. I no more fear you than I fear a fly. I'll put one to that and here goes, you sneaking son of a scrub. And so would I. Come on, sir. Who are you, Tom Morgan? Maybe you thought you was captain's here, perhaps. I'm going to kill the boy. Did any of you gentlemen want to have it out with me? Him that wants it shall get it. You won't fight, then by thunder you'll obey. You may lay to it. I like that boy now. Never seen a better boy than that. He's more a man than any pararatty in this here house. What I say is this, let me see him that'll lay a hand on him, that's what I say. And you may lie to it. Hmm. Ain't have a lot to say. Pipe up and let me hear it, a lie to. John. What? We... We got something for you, John. Step up, I won't bite you. Hand it over, lubber. The black spot. I thought so. What's on it? Deposed. Deposed, that's it, is it? Uh, yeah. Very pretty wrote, to be sure. Like print, I swear. But it ain't one bit prettier wrote than this. What's that? And what does it look like, lads? A chart, that's what it is. A chart. A chart of this island, old French chart. Now, what do you say to that? Yes, that's Lynch, sure enough. That's it. Jaya and a clovitch to it. So we done ever. Silver's the man. Silver. John Silver's our captain, lad. Barbecue forever. Barbecue for captain. John Silver, the captain. Hooray! That was the end of the night's business. Only much later, I woke up suddenly and felt someone beside me. Jim. Jim, my boy. Yes, Long John? I saved your life here tonight, Jim. Now, you and me stick close, Jim, back to back like in case of trouble and... Talking of trouble, Jim, why did those friends of yours leave that chart behind when they cleared out of here? They did, though. I, I came in here this morning and found the place empty and the chart lying there on the table where I couldn't miss it. And there's something under that. Something under that. Good or bad. The next morning, we set out after the treasure. Tall tree, spyglass shoulder, bearing a point to the north and northeast. Skeleton Island, east, southeast, and by east, ten east. Hey, over there! Come quick! At the foot of a pine, half covered with green creeper, a human skeleton lay on the ground. A skeleton, they got! It lay perfectly straight, the feet pointing in one direction, the hands raised above its head like a diver's pointing directly in the opposite. It ain't natural. It ain't natural, but you know, lads, I have a notion in my old numb skull. Now, here's the compass. There's the tip-top point of Skeleton Island sticking out like a tooth. Just take a bearing, will you, along the line of them bones? East, south, east, and by east. I thought so. There's a the pointer. Right up there's our line for the pole star and the jolly dollars. This is one of Flint's jokes, and no mistake, him and these six was alone here. Alone, he killed him. Every man. And this one he hauled up here and laid down by the compass, yes. Six they were, and six we are. And bones is what they are now. I saw him dead, old Flint. Very laid with penny pieces on his eyes. Dead, I sure enough he's dead. 
but he bever spirit walked, it'd be flint. Dear heart, but he died bad, did flint. Oh, I did he did. Eh, uh, may not it were. And the wind he was open, and I hear that old song of his coming out clear as hell. And the death all on men already. Listen. Last words about board. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Shipmates! Shipmates! That's 750,000 ton, not a quarter of a mile from here. When did a gentleman of fortune show his star to that much dollars for a boozy old seaman with a blue mug? And him dead, too. Hello there, John. Don't you cross his spirit. Spirit? Well, maybe. You know... You know whose voice that was? It was... Like a somebody else's, it was like a... <laughs> By the powers! Ben Gunn! Aye? Aye. Aye. So it were. Ben Gunn it were! Why, nobody minds Ben Gunn! Dead or alive, nobody minds <laughs> My glass shoulder, bearing a point to the north of East Kennington Island, southeast and by east, ten feet. Hey, mate, here's the tall tree! The first of the tall trees was reached, and by bearing proved the raw one. So did the second. So the third. Here it is! Hey! Long John! Mary! Here it is! Before us was a great excavation. In this was the shaft of a pick broken in two, and the boards of several packing cases strewn around, all branded with the name Walrus, the name of Flint's ship. The treasure had been found and rifled. 700,000 pounds were gone. <laughs> we turned and saw above us on the edge of the pit, Ben Gunn, Dr. Livesey, Gray, and the Squire, all with muskets. The doctor's plan had worked. The pirates had fallen into his trap. <laughs> John Silver, you're a prodigious villain and an imposter, sir. But you saved this boy's life and I'll not prosecute you. But the dead men, sir, hang about your neck like millstones. Thank you kindly, sir. I dare you to thank me. It's a gross dereliction of my duty. Stand back! It took us three days to move the treasure from Ben Gunn's cave on board ship. On the 8th day of December, the Hispaniola reached Bristol. Five men only of those who had sailed returned with her. Well, that was 19 years ago. All of us had an ample share of the treasure and used it. Wisely or foolishly, according to our natures, Captain Smollett is now retired from the sea. As for Ben Gunn, he got a thousand pounds which he spent or lost in 19 days. For he was back begging on the 20th. Silver vanished on the voyage one night off the coast of Mexico and we heard no more of him. The bar silver and the arms still lie for all I know where Flint buried them. And certainly they shall lie there for all of me. Oxen and wain ropes would not bring me back again to that accursed island. And the worst dreams that ever I have are when I hear the surf booming about its coast to start upright in bed with the sharp voice of Captain Flint still ringing in my ears. Ah, pieces of eight! 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 Pieces of eight. Pieces of eight. You have been listening to Treasure Island, starring Orson Welles as Long John Silver in his own radio version of Stevenson's Great Adventure Story. This is the second in a series of nine special broadcasts presented by the Mercury Theater. And here is Orson Welles himself, writer, director, and star of these programs, 
to tell you about next week's production. Orson Welles. First of all, I'd like you to meet Jim Hawkins, Jr. Our leading man is 14 years old. Last season, he made a really startling contribution to the stage history of Shakespeare's plays. This was during the course of some experiments with the Mercury Theater sprinkler system. As a consequence of what must certainly have been extensive research in that field, he caused it to rain, actually to rain, and copiously to rain, where in more than 300 years it has never rained in Julius Caesar before. It rained on Brutus. It rained all over Brutus in the forum. I was Brutus, and I ought to know. Now, as dramatic criticism, I found this telling and even final. There's a surprise item in the funeral scene. I can assure you that the unexpected appearance on the stage of so many gallons of real water created in us all an impression that was almost overwhelming. Our popular leading man says that he did it all with a match. I don't dare think what he'll do. He's old enough to run for president, but meanwhile, no matter what happens to the plumbing, he can always work for the mercury, as you've probably discovered he's something more than a very gifted performer, and as I told you, he's something less than 15. His name shall not be withheld. I refer to that fine old actor, Arthur Anderson. Mr. Anderson is not new to the microphone nor the mercury. He was prominent in Shoemaker's Holiday and in Julius Caesar as Brutus's boy Jeeves, the sleepy-eyed, silver-throated Lucius in Brass Buttons. He was at least unforgettable. As to our celebrated Mark Antony, George Colurus, who has always somehow cleverly escaped Rainmaker Anderson, he played Captain Smollett tonight. Eustace Wyatt, late housebreaker of Heartbreak House, was the squire. Ray Collins is responsible for Ben Gunn, among other things. And that was Alfred Shirley as Blind Pew. Then you heard Stephen Fox and Agnes, guess what she played, Moorhead, and a Mercury Roundup, William Allen and Richard Wilson inclusive. Jim Hawkins Sr. will bear no comment. Next week... We offer you the ominous and authentic click of the world's most famous knitting needles. Madame Lafarge's needles and Madame herself. Dr. Manette, Sidney Carton, and the entire French Revolution, same time, same station. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. Charles Dickens, that is correct. That is absolutely correct. Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities. There is at this moment a disturbance in the sub-control room, and if it isn't a tumbrel, it's Arthur Anderson. Good thing the program's over. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Please write me. The stories you'd like to hear, and goodbye till next week. Remember 9 o'clock Eastern Daylight Saving Time next Monday night for the Mercury Theater on the Air with The Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. On tonight's production, Bernard Herman composed the original music and conducted, and Davidson Taylor supervised for the Columbia Network. Dan Seymour speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.